Okay, thanks for joining us today. We're here with uh, Sabrina Bazo and Crystal Trull, uh, candidates for the San Diego Unified School District uh, Board. Um, and uh, they'll each have uh, uh, two minutes for closing statements at the end of the conversation, but we're gonna jump right in uh, uh, to questions um, uh, first. So let me start by kind of, you two have very similar backgrounds in, in, in one sense, and I'm curious how that's informed um, your decisions to run. Let me just, for the sake of those watching, um, San Diego Unified School District is the second largest school district in the state has roughly 100,000 students and a $1.5 billion budget. Um, uh, Sabrina, you uh, uh, live in Sorrento Valley, are the executive director of the San Diego Academy of Family Physicians, volunteer uh, at the elementary school PTA um, in the past and have volunteered at the Mira Mesa Town Council. Both your daughters went to Mira Mesa cluster schools. Uh, Crystal, uh, you have three uh, kids still in schools. Um, when we talked in the primary, two, uh, one was in elementary and two in middle. Is that still right? Okay. Uh, since then, two are now in middle and one still at elementary. Okay. A promotion. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. um, and you also have uh, worked uh, at, with, with PTAs uh, and on a town council, the Claremont uh, Town Council. So clearly you both have uh, a vested interest in the schools and community service. I'm wondering, um, uh, how your view of community service has changed since the pandemic when everyone's lives have been upended and the ability to reach out to people and connect with the community has changed so, so dramatically. Uh, and, and Sabrina, wh how, why don't you go first, please? Yeah, sure. Um, obviously this has been a, you know, huge upheaval for everyone's lives. And uh, so back in March, you know, we were kind of not sure how to move forward with the campaign and just like you said community service and and i wanted to do something but what could that be without you know um directly face-to-face -face, um interactions so one of the things um my friend who was actually the the principal at sandberg elementary when my kids were going to school there and she's now on my campaign team um she and i started a volunteer tutoring program and what that consists of is uh, we recruited students from Mira Mesa High School because we wanted to make it a community thing, but we really wanted to identify students that are most in need. And those, you know, uh, there's a lot of learning pods and people hiring tutors, but we wanted to make this a completely volunteer activity. And we wanted to try to identify those students, like I said, that were struggling the most. So we um, formed a partnership with the principal at Mira Mesa High School and then also at Sandberg Elementary and uh, we worked with the teachers and the administration staff and we um, again identified those students that that really needed the extra help and we started a zoom uh, tutoring sessions and we started with like one or two tutors at the high school just kids we recruited um, who were interested and now we're up to about i think like 25 or 30 tutors at the high school and we've probably reached about 50 families both at the um, grade school middle school and now high school and it's certainly something that, you know, we think could be replicated in other areas. I mean, it's like zero cost, basically. And a lot of these kids just really want to help. I mean, a lot of we've had more trouble finding the kids that need the help than finding, you know, we have a, a ton of people that want to be tutors um, and are still trying to identify some of those pockets where we can, you know, reach the kids most in need. Um, and just things like it, their parents not speaking the same language. Um, or, you know, English as a second language, um, dealing with challenges with that, trying to get the, to make sure they get on the Zoom because a lot of them are younger. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a challenge, but it's also been like a wonderful opportunity that we would have never had otherwise, kind of a silver lining in the situation. And Crystal, how about you? How, how's your uh, view of community service changed in, in the pandemic? That's a great question. Well, first of all, thanks, thanks for having me and for um, uh, providing this opportunity. Um, my view of community service hasn't changed. It's always been serving the community. And even more so with the pandemic, we see that people really want to give back. I mean, to Sabrina's point, we, finding the amount of volunteers, it's like find, we have more volunteers than actually jobs for them to do. So in my work with the nonprofit sector, um, I've, I've always been very engaged in the community. And um, currently I'm serving as an interim executive director um, through my consulting work at an organization called Hands-On San Diego. So through the pandemic, we've been connecting uh, volunteers in the 
community with the urgent needs that nonprofits are facing. Um, and we've um, partnered with United Way of San Diego to create this volunteer hub, a one-stop shop for folks to go to. So, um, so you know, my, my, my view of community service has not changed. And that's one of my, um, I would say, core values, my ethos. You know, you serving your community is, is an opportunity. It's a privilege to be able to do that. And um, so, so often, my husband and my close friends are saying, stop volunteering. You're just doing too much. Because I, I really feel like I want to give back and I want to offer my skills and my um, my abilities to make my community better because this is where we live. This is, you know, where we're going to spend our, our future. So, um, you know, I think the pandemic has really provided um, uh, even more opportunities for community service. And it really has, I think, strengthened that um, San Diego pride that we have as a community. We like to help one another and the pandemic has really offered. It looks a little different, you know, virtually. Um, we have to take some precautions in terms of virtual volunteering and, and um, committing, you know, to helping our, our community, but, but the spirit is still there. And so, um, so I'm proud. I'm proud to be a part of community service myself personally and all that I've done and I'm still continuing to do as well as supporting uh, nonprofits in their work work? How, um, obviously the pandemic has led to uh, virtual learning, as you know, Crystal, very well, I'm assuming, uh, but also questions about when campuses should reopen. There's a new parent group called uh, Reopen SDUSD that wants a reopening timeline, wants target dates, wants greater transparency, isn't, doesn't think the school board and the school district uh, and the teachers union have done what they should do. Uh, how, and, and I think 2,200 people have signed this petition now calling for um, greater transparency and a, and a, and a better plan. What, how do each of you assess the district's reopening plan and under what timetable would you uh, support reopening? And Crystal, why don't you go first? Great, thank you. I was just trying to write down questions <laughs> so, I, so I don't miss it. I'm kind of, I like to write things down to process them. Um, so how would I assess the district's reopening plan? So we all know I'm a parent of three kids uh, during the spring. I was keeping track of 13 different teachers and 13 different platforms, multiple platforms on top of that. So, so you know, the distance learning plan um, that we have in place um, is, is not, is not going to work for the long term. So the reopening uh, plan, uh, I, I believe we have to put Safety first, of course. We have to make sure that our students are safe, our teachers are safe, um, our school sites are safe. Um, but I don't think the district is really, there's not a sense of urgency in terms of opening the school sites. We see the community is um, really wanting this. And for families that are, that are okay sending their children to school, they feel comfortable, we need to make that an option. We certainly have the space. You know, there are many, many school sites across the district that um, have space, whether it be outdoor or uh, additional classrooms. Not all schools are at full capacity. So it's really about, um, in terms of timeline for reopening, I think we need to look at it, uh, speeding that process up. I know the district is planning on bringing some of the vulnerable students back right away. But, um, you know, there are students that may not be technically vulnerable, but still need that school environment to really help them uh, mitigate any learning loss that they've, they've um, experienced over the distance learning process. There are students that need schools for the socialization. We've seen, you know, the, um, the emotional effects of, of students who uh, don't get that opportunity to be with, you know, their friends and their, their, their um, you know, their, their peers. And, um, and so, so the school, I feel, it needs to, uh, the district needs to move up their time frame um, and allow those school sites that can open, open safely and giving the option, which requires some flexibility and some um, adaptation that is a little challenging for such a large district. But I think we need to be intentional and really, it's hard work, but that's our job. We have to do that in order to fulfill our mission, educating the students. So, um, so you know, that's, that's where I am. I personally would love to see the school sites open because I know a lot of families that really need that. Um, and I think that the district can work a little harder in, in making that happen. Uh, let me ask you a quick follow-up before I go yeah. uh, to Sabrina. So Unified is gonna, their plan is, as you suggested, reopening uh, uh, starting next month with, I think the first, uh, as, as many as 12,000 elementary uh, students who have um, learning loss or demonstrated uh, you know, needs. And then after that, if that goes well, they bring them back on a hybrid basis, reopening again at all elementary school um, uh, campuses. Do you think there should, so next month is here in two days or, or whatever. So we're, we're basically almost there. So what would your plan look like? How, you said you'd like to speed it up, but what specifically would you do different than what the board has, um, uh, is, is enacting? Um, do, is that a follow-up question Correct. for me? Correct. Yeah, okay, for you, great. Crystal. Yeah. yeah. So um, again, you know, I know over the summer the district had uh, each school site kind of map out how they would open. 
Um, so I'd like to revisit that and see what school sites can actually open safely using outdoor space, using indoor space. We know that not all families will come back. Um, so we know we're going to have to have both tracks. So really, it's about um, opening the school sites that can, that have the physical ability. To, we have $14 million of PPE equipment that's already been purchased. So we can put that into play. Um, we can uh, open the schools that have that capacity, find out from the teachers who wants to, who is willing to come back um, to make sure that, you know, they're, they're okay with that. Um, so I would address it in that way, figuring out what schools to open first, figuring out what kind of teacher capacity we have to figure out if the teacher should maybe a group of teachers who don't want to return to school sites can take on the virtual component. Those who want to return to school sites can provide that. So, um, so we need to give the school sites some flexibility and then they need to find out from their families who wants to come back so we know what kind of numbers we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And Sabrina, how would you assess the district's reopening uh, strategy to date and, and how would it be different if you were on the board? So as you mentioned, um, I actually, well, I'm a, a public health educator and I had my master's degree from in public health from San Diego State University and I've been a public health educator in the community for about 25 years now. And with, with that background, I believe strongly that, you know, of course we need to reopen our schools, but um, the emphasis needs to be on a safe reopening. Um, I have a daughter who, both my daughters graduated from recently from, uh, from the Mira Mesa cluster. The younger one is at Colorado State right now and living in her sorority, which they're being very strict, but it's a hybrid model. So she's in classes somewhat and, and, and it, on the um, website for others. But uh, the, the problem is, and not so much at that school, but several schools where they have reopened and as you know, you know, schools have had to shut down. So I think that's what we're trying to avoid. Again, we are the second largest school district in a huge state uh, already. So that would be my main concern. And there's nothing more important to me, obviously, with my background in the health and safety of our students. And we all know that we want our kids to go back to school. And I think there is a sense of urgency from that matter. I mean, how can there not be that, you know, it's the most important thing we need to focus on right now but we need to balance that with the dangers that are associated with COVID. And we need to work and take advice and counsel from our metal, medical experts. For example, um, the board has collaborated with UCSD and pulled in a task force of medical experts. These are public health experts who are not only you know, local, locally known as that, but are also internationally in some cases uh, public health experts in their fields, including things like ventilation and epidemiology. And uh, fortunately, we have a strong relationship working with our public health officials and many of those individuals, the physicians I work with um, on our board through the San Diego Academy of Family Physicians, many of them are on the front, front lines of this epidemic. And I'm very proud to you know, be partnering with them and being able to be the one providing resources and education to them to treat their patients. Um, so because we have that great working relationship, it's not that the district is in a bubble. None of these groups are, and the students certainly aren't. So we need to be working with our county health officials, with the um, UCSD experts that they brought in to make these uh, decisions. And the plan for reopening needs to be dictated by the medical data and the advice from our, those local public health leaders. Um, and we also need to have a plan in place in case there is another outbreak. What's that going to look like? Are we going to completely shut a school down again? I mean, then you just, everything you planned is, you know, up in, you know, up in the air at that point. Um, and so only by using the data will we really be successful in putting together this plan that is realistic and looks at all the components that need to be addressed. <clears throat> and also when we do roll out a reopening plan, it needs to be a communication, I think, to all, you know, with all school staff on board. Um, again, you know, our students are not in a bubble. Um, they, you know, are around their teachers. They're around custodial staff. There's going to be nurses. Are we going to have enough nurses? Are we going to have, um, you know, increased custodial to make sure those classrooms are being cleaned, you know, more frequently than they, they do right now? Are we going to have extra aids in case in some classrooms, if there's 30 kids in a classroom, well, if you can't have all 30 in there at the same time, what are you going to do? Are you going to take half the kids and have them somewhere else on a campus? And in the younger grades, you know, that would obviously provide, need more supervision, even at the, at the high school as well. And, you know, also all those things need to be taken into consideration and how is, you know, how are we paying for all of that? And um, so, yeah, I think making sure that we have regular updates with the school clusters as 
this plan rolls out and the representatives would need to be from custodial classified staff teachers as well as admin to confirm the communication is, is streamlined and you know we have a smooth process in place so it sounds the like this, let me just a quick follow-up so it sounds like you are supportive of and satisfied with the district's response to date well i don't know if i'd say supportive and satisfied i think like i said it, they're they're working in um, with in collaboration with a larger group of individuals and I think in terms of the I, I, I do like that they're working closely with public health officials and county health officials and because they're not experts in their own right in terms of uh, you know public health so I think that collaboration and looking at you know looking to the experts for those um, for you know the advice in terms of when to roll out and when that's going to look like is what we need to focus on and what's going to be important. The American Association of Pediatrics says it's absolutely insane that teachers are not considered uh, essential workers and that it's bizarre and strange that as a society, America thinks that grocery store clerks are essential workers, but not teachers. Uh, and it, it warns of the severe effects that will last the rest of the life on kids, especially elementary school kids. To me, this angle has not gotten nearly the attention it deserves. This is the American Association of Pediatrics. This is not Fox News saying what we're doing is nuts. I welcome a reaction from each candidate. Crystal, why don't you go first? Yes, thank you. Um, I agree. Teachers are essential. Education is essential. You know, education is the building block from which we expect our society to really move forward. Um, and education is, is something that all, all of us need. So, you know, if we can open restaurants, if we can open uh, other, other areas where the, the public can gather, we absolutely have to work hard to make sure that our schools are open. We already know, I mean, even, even without some data, we, don't, we didn't take assessment data in the spring like we normally do. And I would venture to say that we know that these, these kids are experiencing learning loss that may or may not be able to be caught up on later. Um, and, and the experience of a child in the school system, it really sets them up for um, a love of learning later. And if their experience, especially in the lower grades, is, is a distance learning, you know, how is that going to set them up to really look forward to going to school and to socialize? And even in the middle school and high school levels, they are, these are critical times that they need that teacher engagement. They need that continual learning. You know, three classes a day is not enough. We need, we need that um, rigorous uh, academic program for these kids in order to build on their foundational skills and apply this learning. So I, I would, my reaction is that teachers are essential. Education is essential. It is essential, essential for our um, society, essential for our future leaders, it's essential for our current, uh, you know, situation that we're in right now. Sabrina? I want to make sure I'm off mute. Um, yeah, I absolutely think it's the most important thing right now. The priority is to get our students back to the classroom. Um, but as ha having said that, again, we can look at examples across the country where students have gone back and have had to go home from school. Our students don't live in a bubble. They are around the teacher staff, the admin, they would be around custodial workers and nurses. We need to make sure that all of those indi individuals feel comfortable in that, you know, going back to school. And again, we need to defer to our public health experts and be working closely with them in a collaborative fashion in terms of this rollout and make sure that when we do bring the kids back to school, that they're not gonna have to go home again. There, it needs to be um, cautious yet, um, you know, data driven. And um, so that we, you know, are not in this constant state of a back and forth where one day they're in school, the next day they aren't. And, um, you know, that needs to be the primary focus in um, putting together, you know, any type of plan where the kids are gonna go back to school. On a related topic, Former California Senate Majority Leader Gloria Romero, a Democrat from Los Angeles, and Assemblywoman Shirley Weber, a Democrat from San Diego, say it's a civil rights issue that the issues are the, that the interests of adult employees are valued over the interests of kids in California public education. Once again, prominent Latina, prominent African American saying these things. So I'm interested to see why people would think that teachers unions are uh, uh, an invaluable endorsement in an era in which California does worse by black and Latino students than Texas and Florida 
and New Jersey and New York and Massachusetts? Why does California think it's doing well by these kids when such prominent people say what's going on is a civil rights travesty? Sabrina? I think, again, as I've mentioned, I don't, I'm not saying that the students should not go back. I'm saying that it needs to be done in a cautious manner in collaboration with our public health experts. And that, you know, we need, there are a lot of physician groups, including the American Academy of Family Physicians, which with whom I run the local chapter, who are in support of a cautious rollout in terms of how we're going to bring our students back. Again, the uh, concern is, do we want our students to come back and just have them all, you know, thrown into a classroom and have to close the class down? We but need that's to make not what, sure. But that, that wasn't my question. Can my I finish? Question can I finish? Overall. Can I finish? Can I finish what I'm saying? Thank you very much. Um, but so I think that that's going to be the most important thing is that we have a thorough and comprehensive plan before we are just bringing our kids back to class so that we're not having the situation where there's the back and forth and that the students are going to end up that's going to end up in the in the end to be worse than you know bringing them back in in a cautious rollout i think one of the things that as it was mentioned before is the plan was to have for example the kindergartners and also the special education students starting first and then gradually rolling out so that we're bringing the students back then the elementary school middle school and then high school um, you know, timeline is yet to be determined on that, but I think that that kind of rollout makes a lot more sense than just bringing all our students back and not having a comprehensive plan in place where we're working closely with public health leaders. I think Chris's question was broader than that. Sabrina, could you, Chris, could you briefly restate it? And then Sabrina, could you briefly answer it? Sure. Sure. Uh, Shirley Weber and, uh, and Gloria Romero say that we have policies that are so favorable to teachers, especially veteran teachers, and to uh, how schools run, that we do not value what's good for the kids. We value what's good for the adult employees, starting with the teachers. So this is not a criticism of the response to the pandemic. This is a criticism of California overall and how it treats minority kids. And what they see as civil rights violations of how kids are treated, because in other states, both liberal and conservative, kids do better who are Latino and African-Americans in, in school because of different rules that do not value adult employees. Well, I think we're talking about two different things when we're starting to talk about, that's more also about the achievement gap. And yes, that is being impacted by the pandemic, but that's, you know, that's just across the board. That's, that's an, a concern outside of just the pandemic that we're dealing with. Of course, achievement gap and those students that are, you know, have the most, the most needs. And I, and the thought is, again, with the rollout bringing those students back to school is to make sure that we are reaching students that are, you know, that are affected the most and doing that gradual rollout so that we are bringing the students back. So I don't think, um, you know, and it's not just the teachers union. I mean, they are, they're not in a bubble either. It's the, the teachers union in, in combination with the administration staff, in combination with the, um, you know, front office staff and the students and the parents. So it has to be um, a collaborative effort of all of those groups in, in uh, bringing, this, bringing our students back to school in a cautious fashion that's gonna keep them in school and not this, like I said, back and forth kind of yo-yo effect. That didn't respond to my question about the larger issue of policies in California that value adult employees over teachers. It didn't respond to it at all. I. I don't agree with that. I think our, our, our students are very well, they, I mean, they are the top priority in our schools and the teachers, you know, both of my parents are public school teachers. I mean, I was brought, raised in you know, public schools and the teachers are the heart of the system. Teachers go into teaching because they wanna be there for the kids. Yes, they're concerned about their own um, health because you know, why should they not be concerned about their own health, of course. They want to stay in their job, but um, I think the teachers as a whole want to, you know, be there for their students. That's, that's their primary goal in their careers and, you know, what's driving them. And so I, I think that, you know, that there might be people saying that, but that doesn't necessarily make that a true statement. Crystal, do you want to tackle that question about uh, teachers? Uh, Chris? 
Um, there was a lot. There was a lot in, in that discussion. Um, <laughs> I think there's a couple things that are happening here. Um, if I can just kind of assess where we're going with this discussion, you know. So I, I will just put it out there. You know, the union is always kind of the white elephant in the room. Um, there is a sense from parents. Uh, many, 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 many parents feel that the union um, is not serving their children. Um, and so, you know, even over the summer, we we saw that. Um, you know, they were going back and forth in terms of creating the online agreement, the distance learning agreement. Uh, there was a, an in-person agreement and then the online distance learning agreement. But yet we didn't hear as parents what the plan was to actually create a rigorous learning uh, structure. Um, so, you know, when you look at the mission of the union, it's to protect their members, which are teachers or, or classified staff or whatever the union may focus on. So, so they're doing their job. But the job of the district, the mission of the district is to educate students. So these policies that are developed, you know, up in Sacramento and even, um, you know, within agreements that are made with San Diego Unified and the, and the um, STEA, you know, they, 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 there is a sense that they, they put the adults first. We see it in some of the pension allocations. We see it in some of the benefits, um, you know, and we see the budget constantly facing this, this crisis. And I'm calling it the fiscal cliff. You know, how are we going to have enough money to really do our jobs and, and making sure these students have what they need? So, so I would agree that some of the policies are made do tend to put adults first. Um, and, and from my perspective as a parent and as a community member, um, I feel like and as a trustee, uh, if I were to have that role and that responsibility, I would want to work to make sure that the goals of the district, the mission of the district is fulfilled alongside the goals of the union so that they are complementary and they're not combative or, or they don't seem, uh, they, they, they work together you know, so that all of the stakeholders, and this really requires transparency. It requires um, engagement. Like, for example, when we heard about this um, as a parent, the, the uh, agreement between SDEA and the teachers, um, you know, it was just like this frenzy. We're going to vote on this. We're going to vote. And, and we as parents had no way to communicate what was actually happening uh, in terms of the distance learning experience to, to help to help and support this process of, of um, how we can support teachers. So, um, so, you know, it wasn't really a collaborative process. It, it, it just, it, it, so it needs to be collaborative. It needs to be transparent. Um, in order to really address this kind of pol very polarizing issue, unions, district parents, unions, adults, students, you know, it, it, we just can't move forward if we're going to continue in that way. Let me ask you a specific question about that. Um, it was kind of referenced earlier in this uh, interview, but uh, San Diego Unified teachers are required by their new contracts you were just talking about to provide a minimum of three hours of, um, you know, a variety of live or whole class or small group learning, three hours, you know, that, that, uh, that's not four hours, it's not five hours, it's not six hours. Uh, is that enough? Uh, and you, Crystal, you talked a little bit about the process, but as a school board member, what would you have done to change that if you don't think that three hours uh, is enough? And Crystal, why don't you go first? Yeah, so I would take a step back and really decide, and this is where I think maybe there was a missed opportunity in this agreement process. For the district, we're the experts on education. You know, we, 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 wanna, if, we wanna deliver a quality education and we need expert instruction. This is where we needed teachers. And I really think we missed an opportunity here with the district to not, not base our online learning model on, on a framework that was working to really see. So if we were to have a plan in place, this is what we know works in an online because it's a totally different animal than in-person instruction. I myself am a university lecturer. I teach at UCSD and USD and I transitioned. I had to transition to online in the spring. Uh, and over the summer, I've been really developing the ability to teach online and it takes time. It takes work. It takes a whole new learning uh, process. It's a whole different delivery model. So the district really missed an opportunity to tell and to work with the union. This is what we need to really deliver a quality online learning model. And how can we uh, work with the teachers to ensure that actually happens? So rather than saying, oh, we need three hours minimum, it's kind of like in a vacuum. Well, what are we really going to do with those three hours? Do we know that that's enough time? Maybe it's too much time. Maybe if we based it on a, a framework that was working, maybe we found that two hours of synchronous, this, this instruction, maybe would have been more beneficial. And maybe we do four hours asynchronous. I don't know. I'm just, 
I, I don't think we really decided what would work best. We kind of put the cart before the horse. So um, in, in terms of, you know, the, on, the online learning, um, I think what this has really shown us, and as a parent, I got a peek behind the curtain in the spring, you know, how, how some of these things are being um, delivered. Uh, and so there's really an opportunity to kind of assess, hmm, you know, maybe, maybe our instructional day, maybe we can look at really um, reframing our instructional day so that we can make the most impact with the time that we have. So this pandemic in my mind is really offering us an opportunity like never before to rethink the way we're doing education, uh, to really be intentional, take a step back and say, you know what, is this really serving our students the way we're doing it or just we doing it because we've always done it this way? You know, I'm kind of a, a I guess, a disruptor, a maverick in some ways, because I'm always saying, why are we doing this? And when I work with my nonprofits, I say, why are you doing this? Well, it's because we've done it this way. Is it the best way to do it? And so really kind of coming up with a plan for what we're doing, how we're doing it, and how we know we're going to get there. Uh, Sabrina, how, how would you uh, assess the, the three-hour minimum uh, instruction uh, time daily? And, and uh, generally, what are your thoughts on distance learning and the process so far? Yeah, I would say that, you know, three hours, It, it again, it's it's hard to you know, determine three hours for one student might be clearly enough time, three hours for an, another student, maybe not so much. When we rolled out our volunteer tutoring program, there are students obviously who are, you know, on board, right, you know, are, are going to be <clears throat> sitting and, and very focused. And there's going to be other students that, you know, you'll, you, we found with this, with the students that are helping them need to have, take a lot of breaks where they, you know, or maybe play a game with them. Um, it's, it can't just be like, on you know three hours you know solid of just in front of a screen so what that looks like it it might look you know like an hour and then you know time to play in between especially for the younger kids um, another hour you know later or even smaller broken up pieces um, so I think also that the teachers what they were doing in the classroom you know and talking to my friends that are teachers it's not just moving from a, you know, a classroom setting, it's a completely different type of learning process and how you're teaching your students. And some teachers are gonna be better than that and, uh, than others. You know, some teachers are not as technologically, um, you know, comfortable in those settings. And, you know, there's the issues with Wi-Fi or, you know, not having a proper computer, you know, settings and, or, you know, set up and that type of thing. So there's so much to consider in that. But I think, you know, the, the three hours should, you know, I think as a minimum, um, you know, it sounds satisfactory, but what that's going to look like, I think in real life and rolling that out um, is going to kind of differ for, you know, based on grade level and, uh, you know, teacher style. And also, um, I was involved this weekend, there was a Parents for Quality Education seminar where they talked, you know, it was interesting because we got to listen to different uh, parents and their concerns and also suggestions for uh, online learning and um, some of the experts in education. And they were saying, in addition to just, you know, to having the teacher talking to you, you know, different things like pairing up with other students, um, you know, uh, work, you know, reading, things like that, or, or writing, which don't necessarily need to have screen time involved with them. But those types of things, again, silver lining of having you know, the opportunity to do things a little bit different or taking time away, you know, where kids are, are gonna write a little piece and then share with the class. Um, you know, so there's a lot of different ways to incorporate learning into, you know, what's maybe three hours, maybe more, maybe a little bit less, but I think it's more about the content and what they're taking from it and what they're absorbing from the class rather than to put, you know, the specific time frame that needs to be looked at. Let me ask you guys about, the, about the cost, a quick cost about the, co the cost of, of distance learning. I think Unified has recently estimated it could be up to $150 million for reopening and expanding distance learning. And so that's a 10, that's 10% of the, of the of Unified's budget. And obviously some of that money may come in through federal dollars or state dollars, but it's a big chunk of change uh, for a, uh, a budget that's like 90% personnel. And so you don't have a lot of wiggle room there. So I guess my question for you is, persuade us that you're the right person to manage the district's budget and that would make decisions, um, uh, you know, how would you decide where to cut, what to look at um, as you're handling what's gonna be a super, super tight budget? And, and Sabrina, why don't you go first? 
So yeah, I mean, even before this distance learning situation came about, um, we've had a budget deficit and every year we've had chronic problems with the uh, budget. And, you know, I think we would, I would do whatever it takes to approve a balanced budget. I think, um, you know, proposals as have worked in the past to some degree would include providing early retirement or other opportunities to encourage natural attrition where that is possible. Um, of course, we have to keep those cuts away from the students and particularly those with the highest needs and the least amount of resources that should always be the most prior important priority to keep in mind with any kind of budget cuts in the district. Um, I think it's also in important that we have a thorough understanding of the entire budget process in order to be able to explore all our alternatives, looking at everything, just like we've been thrust in this situation. Are there you know, other areas that we, we haven't looked at? Um, however, like I mentioned, the San Diego Unified, it has been in a constant state of dealing with chronic budget deficit from year to year, pre-pandemic. Uh, pre um, and so I think a long-term solution for comprehensive budget reform is going to be more what the solution is. Um, because California ranks in the bottom 12 states in the country when it comes to how much we spend per pupil for our public schools. And I think I've always thought that was wrong and we need to do better, especially since we're the fifth largest economy in the world. And so one of my number one tasks as a school board member, if I were honored to have this position, would be to lobby to, to have the new federal administration in January 2021 to provide better stimulus funds for public schools, particularly for the next public two years because we need to work in collaboration with other urban school districts nationwide in order to dramatically increase our education funding, particularly on where we are right now. Um, I don't think the public schools themselves are broken and that there's a lot of educators that are working in our neighborhood schools and are really finding new and groundbreaking ways to teach their students. Um, I think what's broken is how we're funding our public education. And so with that, we, you know, public schools need that proper funding to provide resources for their classroom and not have to worry every year that they might be laid off, especially the younger teachers. And in order to have this happen, um, you know, we need to work together as a larger unit and um, you know, demand those federal stimul stimulus funds to get our, get our schools back on track. Thank you. Um, Crystal, yes, how would thanks. you handle the budget? How would I handle the budget? Wow carefully. Uh, so, you know, I think it's time to really take a deep dive into the budget. So um, a couple things come to mind with this question. So in my work with the nonprofit sector, you know, we get a lot done on very, very little resources. So we're, we're you know, we're, we're um, the efficiencies there. Uh, so um, in terms of resources, so I always go back to the mission, you know, what's the mission of San Diego Unified? It's to educate students, make sure that they're prepared for society of tomorrow and their choice of college or career readiness. Okay, so every decision about a resource should be focused towards the mission. And we talk about resources, it's not just money, it's the people, it's the property, it's the intellectual resources that we have. So I would, I would want to take a deep dive, dive into, are, are the right people in the right places? Are we using their skill sets to the most that we can? Are our properties being used uh, appropriately? If we do on-site learning, maybe we uh, look at certain campuses that are open and available to reduce costs uh, rather than opening all the campuses. We look at certain campuses. You know, are we, are we making sure that um, our resources are, are used properly? I also feel like um, this is a, a wonderful opportunity to really engage the community in this discussion because there are so many things that are gonna to have to happen. There's so many moving parts. Uh, in my work with the nonprofit sector, I, I find that the people actually doing the work have some of the greatest ideas to uh, approach cost savings because in their work, they're thinking, hey, you know, if we did this, we made one little change, we could save a lot of time or money. Um, so I think it's an opportunity to really engage all the stakeholders, the school sites, the staff, the administrators, the parents, the community uh, in this collective decision as well as educate the community about what's in the budget. I, I have said before, I have tried to look at the budget and really get a sense of what's involved in these different line items. You know, how are the expenses allocated? You know, what is a transfer? What are all these things? And um, there's not a lot of transparency in terms of what these different budget items uh, really entail. And even when you attend board meetings, you know, you just get a slide of all these 
uh, categories kind of collapsed into one big number. Well, what does that number mean? Um, you know, I'm always asking, what's in this number? What's in this number? So I think that um, I, as a board trustee, would want to uh, really take a deep dive, engage the community in this process, provide transparency about what the process is, and um, collaborate with the stakeholders so that we can all make a collective shared sacrifice with whatever those cuts may, may end up being. Um, so I just think it's a, a really great opportunity. And of course, you know, I would want to also um, work at the, at the legislative level and make sure that we have a seat at the table when budgets, uh, when expenses or, or decisions are being made about school funding. Um, I think over the summer, you know, the, the district partnered with LA Unified and a couple other districts to really make a presence at the state level. It seemed to work. But um, I think we even have some, some muscle power even within San Diego County. We don't need to refer to these other districts. We have, you know, uh, many, many school districts here in our own county that we can partner and collaborate with to create this collective voice so that we have a seat at the table at the state level. So, you know, there's a few different ways that I would approach it. And I really, I just, I just need to dig into that budget and, and get people in the conversation. Thanks. The uh, school districts around the country are reporting rather dramatic drops in enrollment uh, in Los Angeles. I think the number was 6,000 students down. In San Diego, it was maybe 2,500 down. And a large percentage of those were kindergarten students. So I had two questions on that. A, were you, su were you surprised by the, dr the drops? Uh, public schools are already facing a lot of competition from the private sector already. Is this gonna be a, a more of an existential crisis for the public school system that people are pulling their kids back? And second, how do you get, uh, what are you gonna do for these kids that have been held back? Uh, the, the 1,700 kindergartners that didn't show up, that were expected to show up, how do you catch them back up once things do reopen? Sabrina, why don't you go first? So yeah, I think that's a, a huge concern. Um, you know, that's that's a, a a large dramatic number of students, and yes, they are going to be behind. And I think it's not just you know the kindergartners, but of course them. The, I think all the the kids are going to be behind. So whether that entails you know starting next year um, with a lot of, um, I guess, um, you know, follow up from, from previous years and trying to bring students up or, you know, they've talked about even over the summers, um, adding extra instruction as well. I mean, I have, you know, my two girls, I can't imagine having to, um, you know, do kindergarten uh, online learning. I think um, programs such as the tutoring program that we've provided, um, we have been working with some kindergartners and just giving them that additional um, time, even with the, you know, the high school students, they love working with the high school students because they're the big kids and having that extra time just for reading and, you know, and that's a zero cost program. So you could almost replicate those kinds of programs ac across the district at really very little cost and, you know, helping with um, some of those delays in, uh, know, getting students back to school and getting them up to grade level. Crystal? Yes, okay, so um, the first part of your question, uh, was I surprised? No, I wasn't surprised. I mean, I've been talking to parents all summer long and I sent out two surveys uh, trying to understand where par how parents were feeling about distance learning. In the second survey, I asked, what, would you, what will you do if San Diego Unified, it was focused on San Diego Unified, about 300 responses, um, what would you do if uh, distance learning continues in the fall? What, what are your plans? Half of them said they would find something else. So, so I'm not surprised, um, especially for the kinders. You know, if you have, I know that there are many parents who are trying to keep their children away from screen. So if you're gonna send your kinder and, and have this distance learning where most of the time's gonna be spent in a screen, more than likely you're not gonna do it. So, so I wasn't surprised. The second part of that is, um, you know, what do, you, what do we do for those kids who, who um, need extra support? Um, I think that uh, with um, developing uh, some, some stronger um, support systems over the summer would be great if we can partner with some uh, local agencies, nonprofit organizations, education organizations uh, to really give these kids um, a little extra if the school district is unable to financially 
um, to help these, these kids make sure that when they start their new year, that they're ready. But I also think we need to do assessments. We need to really understand and gauge where they're at so that we can address these things earlier rather than later, um, which, is, which is really important. Um, I was trying to, to remember the term that the, the district is moving towards um, rather than, I think it was um, retention, they're going more towards remediation. I, forgive me, I don't remember the term, but basically they want to just um, you know, address students not not bring them kind of up to speed but to kind of keep them in the same space that other students are um, but i think that we need to make sure that their foundational skills are strong so that they then can move forward so um, it's a bigger question i i think um, that really requires some some planning some thought around but i think we do need to provide some extra support for those students not just the kinders but all of the students who um, could benefit um, from from extra support and i think we can really reach out to our community to help us do that these agencies are already providing learning pods they're already providing these educational uh, extra you know kinds of enrichment programs that um, so they're already in that space so so why not um, work with them in order to help these kids move forward in 2014 in 2014, the legislature approved the local control funding formula, which uh, directed more funds to schools with high numbers of English language learners, foster kids, and poor kids. The legislative analyst office and the state auditor have come out with reports in recent years that say this money, instead of going to actually help these kids in need, went to teacher raises in most school districts. Uh, to me, this kind of makes the whole debate over education in California uh, a skewed debate because we do not acknowledge the bad faith with which schools are executing their responsibilities. So I just wonder how uh, either of you feel about the local control funding formula and the fact that its original intention to help kids who need help turned out to be a way to provide raises to teachers in urban school districts. Crystal, why don't you go first? Yes. Okay. So um, I sit on uh, the SSC, the school site council uh, for Holmes Elementary and Marston Middle School, where my kids go to school. And um, we, we go over, we work, well, Holmes, Holmes does not receive um, Title I funding, which is some of the L LCAP money, which comes from the LCFF. Uh, Marston does. And I, I do believe that there is, a, um, we can do more in terms of transparency, what, what that money actually goes towards. Um, and to find out after the fact that, um, I'm not familiar with, with the exact uh, report that you're talking about, but um, if we find out after the fact that the money was not used properly, that's a process breakdown. Um, in order to understand what this money is being used before it's spent and allocated. So, um, you know, I feel like Title I funding really um, should follow the student. Right now in San Diego Unified, there was a decision that uh, the threshold, I think, was 40%. If your school is 40% uh, eligible for free and reduced lunch, you receive Title I funding. But that leaves um, schools out who have these types of students where this money is targeted to support. They, they have to raise money on their own. So, um, so I think there is an opportunity to revisit this funding structure, not only in terms of allocation, but also in terms of transparency and accountability um, you know oftentimes the lcap the report the um, local control accountability plan doesn't that i have found senate unified doesn't really have specifics in terms of how they're tracking and how they're accountable it's very general a lot of their wording is very general the most recent lcap the learning continuity plan uh, in lieu of the original one uh, talks about the pandemic and how they're approaching that and and i've had several um Kind of comments that I've shared with the district about some of the language that's used and, and how it may not be representing really what's happening. So hopefully that answers your question. Sabrina, the LCFF question to you. So yeah, I think it's uh, very important to make sure that the schools are being accountable where they're, for where those funds are being spent. And if it's not following the student, then that needs to be examined more closely and, and determine, you know, why that is and, and you know, where those funds are. Um, I've also, you know, I've also sat and currently sit on SGT and the Student Site Council, the Student Governance and Student Site Council committees. And um, I, I know in Mira Mesa, there was a, a bit of a battle because a lot of the schools that are south of the eight were, um, you know, requesting that the, um, that all of the money for, um, you know, Title I go south of eight or, or the vast majority. And so this idea of having it go to, to the student and not to the school, I think it was important because there's still a lot of students, you know, north of the eight that are, are suffering. So it needs to be targeted at that specific student, not specifically the school. So, um, you know, we had the Title I funds, I think have been a battle for quite some time in terms of how they're distributed. But again, 
you know, I, that there needs to be that transparency and that accountability to make sure that they are being spent wisely. I think one thing, especially as a public health educator that I'd like to see more of is um, this idea of the whole child concept, because I think sometimes you can't just throw money at, you know, a situation with the, where there's a, a learning gap or an achievement gap. I think we also need to look at students as a whole, because if you're a parent, you know that if your kid is, you know, suffering in one area, you know, whatever that might be, they're depressed or down, they're not going to be doing good in school. So if students um, that are having are struggling in school, we need to look at the bigger picture and see what is going on, you know, what's going on in their home life, what's, um, you know, what their community situation is. And that's where I think this pandemic almost, I, you know, in, a, in some ways, I, we don't want to go back to, um, you know, what we've been doing normally, um, uh, you know, to some degree, yes, but to some degree, there's a lot of um, areas we can look at as far as insight and working more with this community school um, concept where we're looking at all aspects of that child's life and, um, you know, having, um, you know, community school workers um, that are that are focused on that, um, maybe in some cases, you know, not taking away from the school police, but making it more of a, you know, a community focus um, and so that, that you know, we're, we're not, um, I guess, just con continuing to spend money on the, uh, the, the, the problem without really knowing if that money is making an impact and, um, you know, look, exploring more um, concepts in a, a wider range in terms of how we um, address these learning gaps. Let me uh, return to um, the district enrollment question for, for a second, because I think part of our conversation missed a big point and then a, um, a pressing um, issue that, that gives this some context. One is this has been a trend for years. Over the last decade, there's been 15,000 students who have fallen off the enrollment. Um, I think when we talked to you both in the primary, uh, Unified was sitting around 103,000. So if Andrew's numbers are right, 2,500 less, this time around, we're looking at getting below 100,000, which is a pretty big threshold to be below if you're one of the bigger school districts in, in, in the state. So clearly that trend is happening and not just that's because of housing and a lot of other issues that are complex. But I, you know, I think your answers to the question about enrollment decline were a little bit about like helping those students when they come back. That assumes they're gonna come back. Like the Worcester San Diego had a, had a story quoting and I'll just read it here. Um, a, a fourth grade parent who's like, we've been failed by the district and the union at the leadership level. They have failed us. I don't think they worked in the best interest of students. And, and she said, she's not bringing her student back. La Jolla Elementary uh, was down 20%. You know, some, some of those are kindergarten students who, yeah, may come back in first grade. There's no state guarantee. You even have to go to kindergarten. So it's not like there's like a process. You just say, I'm keeping my kid home for safety or because they can homeschool or because I have privilege and means, whatever. Um, and maybe those kids come back in first grade, but some of those kids are going to go to private school and stay in private school. So I guess my question to you is, do you think that that's a problem and, and how would you combat it? I mean, the school district's response was a press release that had the headline something along the lines of um, uh, San Diego Unified School District warns against kindergarten gap year. Like that's their, that's their uh, uh, response, which doesn't seem to me adequate enough to address this uh, group, this cohort of students that's leaving, that's abandoning public schools in San Diego. Kind of a lot to unpack there, but I guess the question is, do you think of this as a problem or is this just, you know, a trend line that's going to continue? And uh, Sabrina, why don't you go first? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a problem, but I think you also need to take into consideration the socioeconomic, um, um, you know, statistics here, um, you know, you mentioned La Jolla. Um, I think some of the students that are go going to be going to private school are the ones that can actually afford it. There's a lot of students in this district that um, can't afford to, you know, switch over to a private school. I'm sure maybe, you know, they won't want to in this situation. So, um, you know, that's, that's one factor. And, and you know, pe parents need to, of course, have choice in this matter. And if they feel like this is a better focus for their student right now and they can afford that, then, you know, they they certainly need to have that opportunity to do so. But I, again, I think then what happens is we're looking at more of the kids at the, you know, at the bottom that are already in that, uh, and it, you know, and they had having issues with, with the, you know, the achievement gap and being on the lower level of that. And so, um, 
as much as we want to keep those students staying in the district, um, you know, again, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. I mean, no one wants the schools to be closed right now. Um, but I think, as we mentioned earlier, trying to reach out to some of those parents would, would be probably helpful if we could look at, and I know that they've done this um, at the high school, when they have kids that don't show up for class, for school at the beginning of the year, um, you know, I know that our, our principals and admin staff have actually reached out to those parents and said, hey, what's going on? Like, why are you not at school? What, and finding out why and getting input from those, those parents and guardians of those students. And, you know, what could we do better? And, you know, can we work with you? And, you know, it'd be a much bigger um, issue to do across the district. But if you had the, the specific schools where those school, those parent, those students were going to be starting school, um, you know, drawing up lists and trying to reach out and say, you know, I know this is a difficult time for everyone. Is there some, you know, can we work with you and, you know, keep your student from uh, leaving because you're an important part of our community and, and we'd like to, you know, keep your students enrolled. Crystal, that, that question to you about um, people who are leaving and, and maybe not coming back. Yeah. Um, so I think what we're seeing is um, the effects of a fundamental issue with the district. Um, I've mentioned it before, you know, there's a lack of trust. There's a lack of trust with parents um, that the district is going to be able to provide a quality, uh, rigorous curriculum for their child. And so I have talked to many parents uh, who are, are really conflicted with this choice. And I want to keep my, my child in public school, but yet I know that the best thing for them is to have a, a, a curriculum and a, a learning framework that works, which means I may have to move them to potentially a private school or, or a different type of learning environment, taking them out of the district itself. So, um, so I think it is a problem. Uh, and it probably will continue unless the district really um, can turn the tide on this trust piece. And it's going to require, again, this transparency. We, ha we have to be more transparent about why decisions are made, how they're made, how it's going to support student learning. We have to acknowledge the failures and we have to learn from them and move forward. Um, so, you know, I, I think that um, the enrollment issue will also, uh, if it continues, it's, it's going to kind of widen, widen this gap between the haves and the have nots. And that's not gonna be good for anybody. Um, we see learning pods happening right now and that's creating equity issues. So, um, you know, so we're starting to see, parents are gonna do what they, what they physically, is, what's physically, what they're physically capable of doing to make sure that their children, um, you know, have, have the resources that they need. And so I think it's the district's responsibility to tell and show parents that we want to work with them to make that a viable option don't, you know, there's a lot of things we can't control, the economic issues, the housing, but let's work with the things we can control. And I think trust is really at the basis of that. Um, I would like to ask you both, um, there's a vast growing Latino population of students in San Diego Unified, um, something like 9% black students, growing Asian population, and a lot of English language learners. How are both of you ensuring that you will reach out not only to the students that are in these categories and that may need additional support, parents. How are you making sure that the parents' voices um, are at the table and get expressed in their opinions about what they want in their children's education? If each of you could answer. I'll start. Um, you know, so parent engagement has been um, one of the fundamental pieces of kind of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, so parent engagement is absolutely important to me. And, and, and I think that um, there are lots of different ways to ensure that um, English learner families, black families, families of color, Latinx, uh, Latinx families, they are really um, heard. So, you know, the district already does a really good job in translation. So we have a lot of resources there to work with. Um, now that we're moving into a virtual, we've moved into a virtual world, um, offering uh, virtual engagement processes, but not all families have access to internet. So we still have to be out in the community somehow. You know, I'm committed. One of my, my, my um, commitments that I made from the very beginning was that I need to be out in the community, hearing parents, listening to them, hearing their, uh, 
um, concerns, hearing their, their potential solutions, um, being able to address these at a local level so that it doesn't mean that, you know, they go through all these channels and they're never really heard. So um, for me, parent engagement is, is, is fundamental to um, really ensuring that, that the students are, are set up for success. So there's a lot of different ways, um, you know, electronic, in person, uh, language translation, of course, working with existing clusters, working with community groups that are, are active in these um, with families from different communities, ensuring that there's an engagement process. And when I say engagement, it's not what the district means by engagement. My version of engagement is two-way engagement, going to the community, hearing and listening and talking, going back, going back to the community. This is what's happening in the area that you talked about was, was a problem. These are the solutions we're trying to address. It's real engagement. It's an ongoing process. It's not just, oh, I've talked to you, moving on, checking off the box. It's really taking what they have to say and making it matter. And I think, again, it goes to that trust. A lot of times parents are, are they talk, they're tired of talking. They want to know that they're actually being listened to. So, um, so that is something that I feel is, is really important and is something that I'm committing, committing to doing. And of course, finding out the, the channels that are already uh, in place um, and then looking for ways to increase those channels for, for parent engagement. And Crystal, just before Sabrina answers the question, can you tell us what you've done to do all that? Who have you reached out to? Which groups have brought you closer to those voices? Yeah, so um, I, so in Claremont, we have, we, in District A, it's Claremont, Mary Mason University City. So we're, we're a microcosm of what's happening in the district. You know, half of our student population, um, it represents, represents those populations, the um, Black, the Asian, Latino um, students of color. So I've been reaching out to my community through the surveys. I've been reaching out to my community through Facebook, live Facebook events. I've been reaching out to my community, talking to parents. I've been attending uh, forums. I've been attending um, a lot of workshops in terms of racial justice, how to make sure that we're providing equitable education. Um, through USD, there's a lot of uh, resources available. Um, just really learning about how to make this more meaningful and to ensure that we're not recreating the wheel and we're working with um, you know approaches that that already have success so um, I can't be out everywhere right now because of the pandemic but I'm, I'm, I'm looking for those opportunities to where I can engage with some of those uh, voices the best I can okay. Sabrina yeah um, absolutely I think you know this is a, a very important component um, you know both of my daughters went to school in Mira Mesa cluster and which is a very mixed, um, you know, um, high rate of Asian um, immigrants, a lot of first generation students. And, um, you know, but I find the parents are very motivated again in working with my tutoring program that, you know, the parents, you know, might be seen as because, you know, they, they can't um, communicate as well, maybe in English that maybe they're not interested or not motivated, but a lot of them are absolutely motivated and want their students to do better. And they're so grateful just to have you know, this, us reaching out as, as volunteers to help them, uh, you know, with their students and, you know, learning issues that they're, that they're um, dealing with. And um, I also think that the, uh, well, right now they're incorporating the ethnics, they're going to be starting to incorporate ethnic studies curriculum for students to, to, and a lot of students, when they can celebrate individuals that have had an impact on history that look and sound like them, um, they can perform better and they can have higher graduation rates if they're really interested in that curriculum. And so I think that's one way to look at, um, you know, that, that they can identify more with what's being discussed in the classroom. Um, I, also, I also think we need to incorporate, the, in terms of teaching styles, providing a better pipeline to encourage more teachers from different ethnic backgrounds in order to relate better to our students of color. Um, for example, Again, in Mira Mesa, there's you know phenomenal kids, and they're and they're doing great. And so, if there was a way to identify students, just again bringing it back to our tutoring program, that would be great teachers saying, "Hey, we'd love you to be a teacher and come back and teach, you know, at the high school or the middle school, at the grade school where you grew up. Um, you know, we'll provide funding for you to go, you know, get your, um, uh, you know, go to school for teaching after you graduate from high school." and you know would like you to be back in the community i mean the issue with that is again with the budget is a lot of our newer teachers end up getting pink slipped every year so um that's another issue but having more students that those um students of color that can identify with that look and sound like them and that they you know can relate to and i think also in terms of um the community 
as was mentioned, is also making sure that we are reaching out to the community absolutely. I, again, a silver lining of this epidemic would be um, being able to do the town halls in a Zoom type fashion. Um, and I would plan to absolutely do that with parents. Um, I, I go to Mira Mesa Town Council meetings as well on a regular basis and have been on that board for several years. And we have students or um, teachers, or, sorry, parents and teachers from you know, across Mira Mesa that attend those meetings and have great ideas. So looking to organizations like that and speaking with them on a regular basis and taking those ideas and what they're saying and bringing those back to the district and actually doing you know, putting those into um, programs, not just, you know, listening and, and you, know, you know, writing something down, but actually, you know, taking an active role in terms of working with um, students and parents uh, and, uh, you know, making sure that the district is listening and, uh, you know, that we're doing something with those ideas and bringing them, you know, into action. And just as a I just wanted to follow up with one thing. You're talking about parents that actually have internet access and that maybe not are essential workers who can't make it anyway. So how are you ensuring to reach out to those parents? Because there's a lot of them out there. They, it's not that they're, they don't want to go to those meetings or tune in on the Zoom meeting. They might not right. have internet access or they're working two jobs to try to make ends meet. So how do you reach out to them? How will you? Well, you know, I, I think there's ways, you know, you can uh, maybe process that through, you know, sending out information. I know through the schools that they're trying to do surveys or trying to reach out to the students or reaching out through the students that we're working with. As we're working with students that have parents that are essential workers, um, you know, I've talked, been able to talk to some of the parents through their students and, you know, they'll call me from work and we'll talk about how the students are doing and what they need to focus on. And so I think if we're trying to, you know, if we're making it, you know, that this is about their student and we want to help them, I think parents are going to reach out and are going to find those ways um, to communicate with us and, uh, you know, make, make things happen. If it means that there's, that's, that's going to be better for their student and provide a, a, you know, increased achievement for their student. I want to follow up because we've talked a lot about parent engagement, but uh, Christy and I just finished a mini series podcast about Gen Z. It's called Hello Gen Z, if anyone out there wants to watch it. And what we've seen is the organizing that these young people do, whether it's from diversifying their textbooks and curriculum. We had one student write about defunding school police. We're just seeing these young people organize at a different level. And sometimes even without their parents' knowledge, we had one student talk about that. Um, and so I just wondered what role you think that the student input plays in the decisions you'll make um, on the school board. I, I'll start. Um, I, I think the student voice is critical. I love Trustee Patterson, Zach Patterson. I mean, he, he's the student voice on the school board and he, he, asks, he asks some really great, great questions, um, very thoughtful questions. So um, the student engagement is huge. Um, I think, you know, there are a few channels already. So there's for schools that have ASBs, for schools who have clubs that are working around, um, you know, specific issues. I think it's important for us to support and encourage those and, and really um, meet with these groups, you know, not just at, have them present at a board meeting, but actually take time to meet them in their group settings to see how they're doing their work and to, to really get a sense of, of what their priorities and where their passions are. And, you know, I, 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 you know, I, love, I love the people who just take action. You know, it's like, just take action ask for forgiveness later let's just get some movement here and, and I love that about uh, our youth that they are just willing to, to take charge so to take the um, the student perspective they're one of the stakeholders and we have to understand that they have a voice and as they get older they have ideas about ways to improve things it goes back to my point of talking to the people who are doing the actual work and students are a part of that um, because they they are living and breathing this work and they're the whole purpose of why we exist our mission is to set up these students for success. So I would absolutely want to tap into that. I've actually kind of been having contemplating an idea uh, when I become trustee is to um, work with a student intern to help understand what it means to be a, a, a government official, an elected official, you know, to help uh, working with them um, in terms of mentoring and what does it mean to make decisions in this level. So I'm, I've been kind of playing around what would it be like to have a student intern to really work side by side with me, maybe a couple of them um, to really uh, show them what this work is like and to help develop their leadership capacity. 
Thanks. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I have um, a daughter who just graduated from college and a second one who's at uh, Colorado State, as I mentioned earlier. And so, um, you know, I have two students that are, are, you know, two daughters are constantly, you know, reminding me how old I am and are, you know, definitely in the, in, you know, your age group where they're very interested in what's going on. Um, and my older daughter actually lives in Philadelphia now where she went to school and is dating, has been dating a black guy for about three or four years. So, you know, he's like a son to me and they've been involved in protests and they have friends that have been tear gassed. So, I mean, it, it, it's scary from a mom perspective, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm right in there in terms of, um, you know, dealing with the son at, you know, in terms of, of, of what's going on on that level. I, and I've also met locally with um, students. Um, I was endorsed by the um, Young Democrats, the college, young, or, which is like the 20 um, something um, students. And I've, and I've talked with them extensively about some of their concerns. And, you know, a lot of them, one, some, one of the things that comes up a lot is college um, readiness, as well as um, financial issues, you know, when they're graduating from college. Um, how are they, you know, able to afford to go to college? And that's a lot of my, my daughter's friends going into college, they didn't have any help. They were completely on their own. And I think it was different when we were going to school. For one thing, school wasn't as expensive. And, um, you know, a second thing, you know, it, I don't know, there seemed to be more maybe family support back then, again, because probably it wasn't as expensive. But um, that's a huge concern of our young people, and it and it shouldn't be. I mean, you shouldn't have to come out of college, you know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars in debt. Um, so I think looking at those kinds of issues um, as they're exiting um, K through twelve, um, making sure at least that you know community college is free for all students, and even looking beyond that, and you know, lowering some of the the tuition, you know, getting those tuition rates down so our students aren't in that constant stress. And I think also the environmental issues is huge. Um, my younger daughter's vegan, so I get a lot of education around that um, issue, and it's been great. I mean, it's really opened my eyes, um, made me much more educated about, um, you know, a plant-based diet and all the things that go along with that and how important that is. And, and young students are, you know, even uh, I think from, you know, grade school, middle school, high school, we need to have more education in terms of, uh, you know, environmental sustainability, environmental justice, what that looks like, what, you know, what they can do. And she's an environmental sustainability major. So, um, but I think we could have more curriculum on those types of issues at the, um, at the lower levels. And finally, also providing more, um, you know, having a class almost, I don't know if you'd call it a civics class, where students are learning in high school, you know, possibly about um, how to register to vote, which we did with a lot of students at the high school, um, how to balance a checkbook. I mean, they don't use it as much anymore, but there are times, um, you know, financial um, viability, things like that. So we're, we're getting down to more um, practical skills that they can use um, when they when they graduate, because a lot of students have said, I didn't, I don't know how to do some of this stuff. And maybe they don't have parent support helping them in those situations. So those would be some of the practical, I guess, things that we could do to address um, our young people and help them feel like they're more prepared when they're uh, graduating from high school. Just really quick as a follow-up and just answer in like 15 seconds. Are either of you, um, I guess, starting with Sabrina on Instagram or TikTok or spending any time where the students spend their time? <laughs> I'll start. Um, so I am not on TikTok, but my daughter sends me TikToks all the time. and. So I, um, I, I'm certainly on Instagram um, and, you know, I have a campaign page for Instagram and uh, enjoy using that. I love, the thing I like about Instagram is it's more visual as opposed to Facebook where everything gets, you know, more, there's a lot more um, consternation, I guess. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'm absolutely have a Instagram and a Twitter and a Facebook. It's hard to keep up sometimes, but, um, but yes. <laughs> So I am not on Instagram. I am on Facebook, although that's for old people. So I acknowledge that. Um, but I do have a lot of friends and family that share Instagram posts with me, TikTok posts with me, um, just funny things or it, educational things too that I should be aware of. Um, and so I try to I try to keep up with with it, uh, kind of on a periphery. But I myself do not have an account. 
Um, I have a couple of questions. First of all, Sabrina, following up on what you said about just teaching practical things at schools, I think we've heard that forever. I don't, it sounds like it's still not being done. Is there mm -hmm. any, why isn't it being done? And is there any real movement to make that happen? I'll let you answer that and I have a second question. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. You know, I'm thinking back to when I was in high school and I, you know, I don't think we had anything like that. I do know when my daughters were both seniors in their AP Gov class, there was a semester on economics and they just had a fantastic teacher, but she made them put together like a budget and they had a certain amount of money and they had to live off of it and they had to figure out things like rent and uh, car insurance. And, um, and so it was like this whole presentation they had to put together. And, uh, and it was funny because my younger daughter, like she ended up having to live out in like Rancho San Diego, I think, or something because she couldn't afford, you know, she, she likes to surf. And so she was, you know, and so it really showed her um, practical, you know, day to day, you know, what, what people deal with. And so I, I, it was entertaining, but it was also at the same time educational. And I, and I don't know if that particular um, exercise is being done. Um, at other schools, but I think it's certainly things we can replicate, maybe not like a whole, you know, it, it's kind of hard to institute that we're going to have a whole class on that, but, you know, having, having the teachers, you know, especially senior year, because um, kids have, are, you know, have senioritis, they're kind of done, they're tuned out, but if you had some kind of um, program where they were actually actively involved and interested, because I remember it was interesting to her because, you know, they're about to step out on their own independently and uh, make that, you know, replicate a program like that um, throughout the district, I think would not be that hard to do if you made it part of an existing class. Crystal, do you want to weigh in? Sure, yes. Um, so I, uh, this is not really happening in a district-wide effort in terms of these practical skills. Um, and I think that uh, it's not happening because we feel like there's not enough time in the day to get some of these things done. However, I, I disagree. Um, I know at, at Marston Middle School, where my children go uh, to middle school, we have these things called advisories. And so it's the first 30, 40 minutes of the day and the kids get to pick every three weeks it rotates, a fun thing that they can do, they can learn. It could be cooking, it could be um, or, you know, paper origami making, just there's a whole list of things that are, that are life skills as well as fun skills. And it's incorporated as kind of that first home, what we used to call home period, it's their advisory period. Um, and it gives them an opportunity. And I think that we can also incorporate some of these um, real life skills into all of what um, our, our kids are learning in, in an applied learning way. Uh, for example, like in math, you know, learning how to balance a checkbook, how, what, what the stock market's like, you know, how, how are we building the foundational skills into an applied manner that doesn't require, um, you know, a whole, maybe necessarily offering a specific class, but it's ways that we incorporate this applied learning into everyday life and to find out from the students what they want. Um, I, I, over the summer, I was meeting with parents and, and the children were also in some of these meetings, the students themselves, and they said, you know, I want to learn how to change uh, my oil, my car, when I get a car. I want to learn how to fill out a job application. I want to learn how to, you know, do a resume. So these kind of like what we take for granted almost, um, really incorporating them into the learning that's already happening. Uh, my second question, thank you for that, um, was it, it seems like you guys have both spent some time thinking about racial justice and equity in education. And I'm wondering if you've identified um, any area in the district where, uh, you know, they're falling short in serving students of color. Well, I can, uh, I can go first with that. First of all, in terms of just addressing the racial justice um, uh, issues, I think one area that is really important and has not been done enough um, is looking at um, implicit bias. Implicit bias training is something that can be done across schools where it's, you know, but not just, you know, admin staff. It needs to include teachers, custodial workers, cafeteria workers, front office staff, where we're looking at our biases because all of us have biases, you know, whether we like to admit it or not in terms of how we assess people. And, I, and part of this training is to take, kind of take a step back and, you know, determine am I, you know, is this you know, racially related, I mean, different. And so anyway, it, it's allowing people to be a little bit more, um, you know, thinking a little deeper about how um, they're addressing these issues and, uh, you know, not automatically jumping to suspending students because as we've seen with the statistics that, 
that has been the standard way to, you know, to discipline, particularly the students of color, and it's not working. So we need to look at these other ideas. Um, in addition to the implicit bias, also, um, you know, restorative justice. Again, there's some of that, those trainings and um, pilot programs going out in the district, but we need to do more and we need to do it across the district. And also, that being said, um, with regard to school police, I know that's been an issue. Um, and I don't agree that we need to get rid of our school police because I do think they, they provide a, a service, particularly if there's dangers from the outside coming in. But I think we can do a lot to reform school police so that they're seen more as mentors rather than as some kind of aggressive, um, you know, fearful type of person that you want to stay away from. Um, I think a, a positive example of that would be the school safety patrol. Both my students, both my kids were involved in safety patrol at their elementary schools. And it was a, a you know, a, 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 um, a police from Sandy Unified policemen who worked with the students and made sure that, you know, the traffic that it was safe in the morning for people coming into the school. But they also served as a mentor. They had a lot of like social type of um, programs. They came to our career day and spoke with the kids. So they were seen more maybe as someone that students, you know, that need that, um, that type of figure in their life, um, you know, that are maybe lacking, could have more of that, that mentorship of, of uh, someone in that role in their life, rather, again, as seen as like an aggressive or um, someone to be avoided. Um, so I think some of that's being done in the district, but I think we, it needs to be done way more and, um, you know, needs to be rolled out to all of our schools. And we need to bring back our school safety patrol. They've cut the budget for that quite a bit. And I think, um, especially at the elementary school, that was a very important program. And I think we need to invest more funding in that. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina, for mentioning Safety Patrol. I was remembering back when I was in fifth, fifth and sixth grade. It was, it was super fun. I enjoyed being on <laughs> Safety Patrol. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think one of the first things that I would want to do that I've identified as an area to really work on is elevate the work of the Ethnic Studies Advisory Committee. Um, they've been doing work since 2015 and making recommendations, doing research on best practice, and yet really little to nothing is known about their work. So I'd want to elevate what they're doing and really help them to be, uh, you know, kind of setting the pace for, for where we're going because there's, it's a very collective working group there. Um, also too, you know, we have to look at three different areas. There's climate, there's structure, and there's curriculum. So are, what's the climate of the schools? Are they, do students feel safe and welcomed? If not, why? The structure, what are the systemic issues in the district itself that's maybe causing some inequities and racial uh, injustices? We have to address those. And the curriculum, you know, the ethnic studies is, is a good start. It's finally here after you know, four or five years in the making. Um, when there's a commitment there from the district, which is good. But again, it needs to be really permeated in all the different levels, of all the different grades, um, all the different facets of the district itself. It can't just be, okay, again, checking a box. You've took your ethnic studies course, you're ready you know, to, to go out into the big wide world. It really has to be um, the essence of who we are as a district. And, you know, from an organizational behavior, you know, I, I do nonprofit management consultant and my background is leadership studies and organizational behavior. You know, I have to look at what's the culture of the district? How can we address the culture? So again, for me, it comes back to this climate structure and curriculum pieces, as well as elevating the work of the ESAC. Can you, a quick follow up, Crystal, where are you on school police? Do you believe that they should be on campus or, or not? Yeah, so I think that we really haven't tapped into the expertise of the school police. For example, some, some school sites um, need different things. So uh, the example I want to bring up is uh, Holmes Elementary. You know, we had a real big traffic problem. We have this school with over 500 students tucked into a neighborhood. There's no commercial anywhere. It's all neighborhood. And so we had cars driving really fast, dropping off their, their kids, and it was a real huge pedestrian safety issue. So we brought the school district police out to give us some recommendations about how we can mitigate and make sure that our families are safe. So that's what we needed at our school site, and they're very helpful. Other school sites may have other issues, maybe maybe related to some behavioral issues. Um, and, you know, maybe there's uh, drugs or weapons being brought to campus. So, you know, how to work with the police. I don't think we've quite figured that out. I think the police, uh, school police is looked at as the enforcement you know they're the they're the you know the, the guys who are going to come take the kids away but really 
um, I think some really wonderful relationships can happen with school, schools and the school police to really work together and be collaborative. Again, it comes back to this transparency. What, what can we do as a police unit, for the Santa Unified Police Unit, to help the schools and how can we give you our expertise so that it supports uh, the school site? So I think there needs to be a lot more conversation about how we can work with police effectively. Thanks. Uh, we probably have time for one more question if someone wants to throw one out. Do you want to, Sabrina, did you want to answer that one? To Charity? She got into it first, yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> why don't you guys go into your closing statements then? Yeah, two minutes each. Um, and, and Sabrina, why don't you go first? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, as Crystal mentioned earlier, I, I just like to first thank all of you for allowing us to have this forum. Um, it's wonderful. I always learn more when I'm, when I'm in these kinds of forums about you know uh what's you know not only what's what the school district is doing but um thinking about and formulating ways and issues or, or, you know ways that that uh, we can work better um but so uh i i'd also like to say I, i'm very proud to have raised my kids in the mira mesa cluster um i as i mentioned earlier i'm, I'm a product of public schools both my parents were public school teachers and this was back in the 70s and they thought it was very important that we grew up in a diverse and ethnic, um, an, an area that's that's very diverse ethnically and so and socioeconomically. And so we went to school in an uh, area outside, of, just outside of Chicago. And uh, so I was raised with those public school values and being around people that aren't don't necessarily talk like you or um, sound like you, but you know you learn and that's how you grow and and I think public school is uh, so important from that component because I think a lot of students once they get out of school you know they don't have that um, as as much that I that um, that you know way of um, integrating with others um, so I'd also just like to say that uh, you know I think it's important my my husband and I took those those um, ideals and when we moved to San Diego, he's a physician at UCSD's family and sports medicine. We wanted to live somewhere where, you know, we had, I had that kind of similar um, experience, experience to have for my daughters. So that's one of the reasons that we uh, chose Mira Mesa and uh, been very happy about that and uh, feel that, you know, we, we've had a wonderful experience in, here. And when my youngest daughter graduated from Mira Mesa in, in 2018, I have not stepped back I'm still an active board member on the foundation, which I served as president for six years at Mira Mesa High School. And it's the largest foundation in the, I mean, I'm sorry, it's the largest school in the district. Um, and also, I'm also on the Mira Mesa Town Council. As I mentioned earlier, I was PTA president at Sandberg Elementary, as well as Challenger. And I've also been on several um, principal interviewing uh, boards, panels, as well as uh, uh, being involved in SGT and SSC. I've been on the site modernization uh, committees for the high school and was very instrumental at the foundation when we had to have teacher layoffs. We were concerned about teacher layoffs. We were able to provide funds from the foundation through a program called Taste of Mira Mesa, which I also ran for six years um, where we raised funds and ultimately was a little bit to save a teacher position. So all that to say that I'm already doing a lot um, just at the uh, you know community level and I'm excited to grow that and you know move to that next step because I'm, I don't just sit on the sidelines. Um, I jump in and I get results. Um, so and, and I'm the only person in this race with that experience from all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade in terms of that parent volunteer experience. And I think it's important to have that comprehensive um, view. Also from my uh, public health background, um, you know, right now being in the middle of a, uh, pandemic and, you know, talking about how we're going to move, be moving our students back um, to school uh, safely. I think having that public health background um, is really important right now. And I think it's gonna, you know, serve me well and helping to make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that we do this safely and in a way where, um, you know, it'll be effective for our students and uh, that they'll, you know, be able to stay in school more long-term rather than a back and forth. And um, so those are some of my, you know, my strong um, reasons for running for this office. And um, again, 
um, I'm uh, thank, thanks for having me and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you guys this morning. Thank you, Sabrina. Crystal. Okay, well, thank you again for taking the time to have us here. Um, so, you know, I, I know the power of public school myself. I was born, uh, I was born on the East Coast, but been here since I was four. Uh, and I went to public schools here in the District A, the University City of Mira Mesa. And I know um, how important public schools are for firm supporters. So I know we're facing a lot of challenges, but we also have an amazing window of opportunity um, to really make sure that we're doing the best for our kids, but we need leadership. We need leadership to make those decisions, um, sometimes the difficult ones that, you know, not only meet the immediate needs of the pandemic, but also go beyond, go, uh, uh, that are focused on the future, um, where our kids or our students will, are headed. So I feel like I bring that type of leadership. Um, I will feel like I'm going to put students first. And um, I see my role as a board trustee as a critical one and one that I don't take lightly. Um, you know, I'm going to make decisions using my academic background. I have a doctorate in leadership studies. I teach at the, the university level. Um, I understand how to use data and research to make informed decisions. I understand uh, instruction delivery and teaching and evaluation. Um, I bring real, real world experience having worked with a variety of communities and my work in the nonprofit sector, really focusing on the mission, what that looks like. Um, I, can, I understand how to develop strategy, uh, strategic planning, identify what resources are needed to achieve the mission. Um, you know, I have a lot of experience collaborating, not only in the nonprofit sector, but also with my with fellow uh, parents and the community and my work uh, as a volunteer, uh, the different school sites and, and other um, nonprofit organizations. And I have a firm commitment that all of the voices must be heard in order to make informed decisions that uh, are the best uh, for all. So um, working together is, a, is what, I, what I bring experience in that. You know, I understand the responsibility of what it means to be a board trustee. I'm overseeing the public's money. I'm entrusted to make sure that these decisions are used or are, are done in a way that resources are used wisely to fulfill the mission. So I, I, I want to make sure that I fulfill that. And I live and breathe governance. I've served on boards. I teach about governance in the nonprofit sector. I understand the fiduciary responsibilities of duty, uh, duty of loyalty, care, and obedience um, that all board, board members are responsible and held, held to. I bring the ability to think outside the box uh, and think creatively. Sometimes it ruffles feathers, uh, and I always approach things with, uh, you know, a glass half full. You know, when people say, "Why would we do something?" I always say, "Why not?" Uh, so I try to I try to um, make sure that we're looking at it all different perspectives and creatively, and creatively, and not just business as usual, because we cannot continue doing what we're doing and expect something different. Um, I don't want to waste any time bogged down by what we can't do. I want to focus on what we can and at least try and put our energies there. So um, ultimately, I'm running to put students first and to make sure that our leaders of tomorrow, who are going to make decisions on behalf of all of us in our community, that they're equipped. They're equipped to be those leaders. So, um, so thank you for uh, providing this time for the share, to share my thoughts. And, and I hope come November, I can count on everybody's support. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. And thanks again, both of you, uh, for joining us today. I really, really appreciate it. I enjoyed the conversation. Me too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.